Good morning and welcome to First United Methodist Church. We're so pleased that you've joined us as we worship during the season of Lent and Easter. This is a very special time of the year and we're so proud that you're with us as we prepare to journey through Lent and then celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Welcome to the morning service of First United Methodist Church of Starkville, the church in the heart of the town with Christ in the heart of the church. Our weekly Sunday services are at 8.30 and 11 a.m. and our evening service is at 6 p.m. Join us now as we come together and exalt Jesus Christ our Lord. Welcome to Startville First United Methodist Church. We're glad that you're here. We hope that you have had a good week and hope that you are ready to worship. A few announcements that I would like to point out to you in your bulletin this morning. Please take a moment and register your attendance with us on the pew pads that are found at the end of your pews this morning. After you have filled those out, please pass them down so that we can get a record of everyone's attendance. 
Also, don't forget about our Lenten luncheons that we have going on on Wednesdays in the CLC at noon. Uh, we have a light lunch at noon, and then the devotional follows at 1230 from one of the area ministers. We invite you to come out and be a part of that. Uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, and a good time of fellowship for us. And don't forget about our international fiesta that's at Star, that, excuse me, that's at Mississippi State University uh, next Saturday. It will be from 11 to 3. Our missions committee is involved with that. It's a good educational time for families. It's also a lot of fun. We encourage you to come out and be a part of that. Children who are interested in waving palm branches next Sunday for Palm Sunday, please meet down in the fellowship hall, uh, fellowship area 10 minutes prior to the beginning of each of the traditional services. Also, don't forget about the Easter egg hunt, which is also next Saturday at 11 a.m. at Moncrief Park. Uh, friends, you are invited to bring your entire family and your neighbors uh, to bring snacks or assist with Sunday school classes. Call Jane Wyndham at the church. We also remind you that we are still taking orders for Easter lilies for Easter Sunday. If you would like to place an Easter lily in honor or in memory of someone, please do so. The deadline is quickly approaching. It is March 24th, and please submit those orders to the office. Mark down on your calendar, on May 16th, Dr. Paul Ruff has uh, taken the enormous task of composing a play for us to summarize the 175 years of this church and celebrate our 175th anniversary. He is writing a script for that and is asking for volunteers, 15, ages 15 to 99. If you are interested in being a part of that, uh, please let the office know. Uh, there are some speaking parts and there are some no speaking parts. So if you're interested in doing that, uh, please contact the church office. Please remember our Stock Punger Now initiative uh, that the children and the youth are participating in. Uh, be mindful and supportive of them as they have undertaken this development. We extend our Christian sympathies to the family of Robert Button. Scott lost his father this week. Also to Laura West and family and the death of her father and Ed Thomas uh, and the death of his brother and also to the McAdams family. Let us stand together this morning for our call to worship. It is six days before Passover and we are heading toward Jerusalem. It is good to be with friends. We watch as Mary anoints Jesus' feet. We smell the sweet aroma. Mary has given sacrificially and has pointed us toward the cross. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we pray now that we open our hearts and our minds. May we be receptive to your words, to your spirit. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Our hymn, The God of Abraham Praise, is numbered 116. Let us sing together all stanzas, please.
please remain standing for our affirmation of faith that's found on page 881 in the back of your hymnal. It is the Apostles' Creed. Let us unite together in this historic confession of the Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds to go to the Lord together in prayer. Almighty God, as we have continued to go through this Lenten season, we have examined our faithfulness. We have examined our spiritual lives. Lord, we have remembered the love that you have given to us and the grace that you have bestowed upon us. But Lord, we pray that we remember most of all the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. You laid down your life for us so that we might have a relationship with you, so that we might be forgiven so that we might be given freedom from sin and death. God, this morning, it is with joyful hearts that we praise your name. We pray that as we are here, that our attitudes are joyful and focused. We pray, Lord, that even though we have not been faithful, that we would leave this place renewed and refreshed, willing to love as we have been loved willing to forgive as we have been forgiven. Lord, we thank you so much for your sacrifice, for how you willingly laid down your life only to take it up again. Lord, you defeated death. In doing so, gave us hope. Lord, we pray this morning that you forgive us for our many sins, where we have fallen short. Lord, we pray that each and every day that we have, we walk closer with you. God, thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. For we ask these things in your name as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now if the children would come forward this morning for the moments with Miss Jane. Good morning. Hey, Hunter. How are you? You got in an accident, didn't you? You okay? Good morning. It is great to see you all back from spring break. Welcome back. Did you see the snow outside a while ago? 
it was snowing. It didn't stick because it's, it was too wet and too warm. But there was snow and sleet and rain all coming down at the same time. How about that? I brought a necklace that I have. This is one of my most prized possessions. And it's important to me because it's a necklace that my husband gave to me when we got married. I would never, I would never sell this because there's no way that any amount of money I got would be what this would show what this is worth to me. It's one of my prized possessions. I want to ask you something. You don't have to say it out loud, but think in your mind, what are some of your prized possessions? What are now I'm not I'm not talking about family, but what is something that you have, something that you own that's very important to you? It may be um it may be a piece of jewelry that somebody gave you. Sometimes it might be a stuffed animal. I know my children had stuffed animals that they they just cherished and wanted all the time or it might be um a toy collection or a special doll maybe it's for some people it might be a a ball a basketball or a football or a baseball that's signed by a famous sports person but think about your most prized possession that you have at home now let me ask you something about that possession if you had a friend come visit would you give your prized possession to your friend just to show them how much you loved them? No, I don't think so. But there's a story in the Bible that we're going to learn about today where a lady main, named Mary did that very thing. Jesus was visiting in the city of Bethany, and he was visiting in the home of Lazarus and Lazarus' two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they were good friends of Jesus. So Lazarus and Jesus were sitting at the table eating and Martha was serving them, bringing the food back and forth, when Mary did something very unusual. Let me tell you what Mary did. She took a jar of very expensive perfume, and she poured the perfume on Jesus' feet and began to wash Jesus' feet with the perfume. And then she took her hair. Imagine she had really long hair. She took her hair and then wiped dry Jesus' feet with the perfume. Now, one of Jesus' disciples, whose name was Judas, was there. And Judas was upset by what Mary did. And Judas said, this is a waste. That perfume could have been sold and the money could have been given to help the poor. It was a year's worth. That would have been a year's worth of money. But Jesus came to Mary's defense and Jesus said, leave her alone. She has saved that perfume for the day of my burial. Now, that's kind of a strange statement, isn't it? But what Jesus was referring to, he knew that in just a few days, he would be crucified and buried. And then we know that Jesus rose from the dead after that, don't we? Yeah. So Jesus knew that was coming, but we don't know that Mary knew that. But what we do know was that Mary was willing to give the very best she had to Jesus as a way to show Jesus her love. Jesus has given us the greatest gift we can imagine in eternal life. Now, I want you to think with me just a minute. What can we give to Jesus to show him how much we love him? What can we give to Jesus to show him how much we love him? I think what we can give him is ourselves. What were you going to say, Zoe? Yes, exactly. And then we give him ourselves. We give Jesus our life when we love him and serve him and follow him in everything we do. And that's what, that's the very best we can have, to, there's the very best we have to give to him, is when we give Jesus ourself. Just like Mary in the story gave her very best, we can do the same for Jesus to show him how much we love him. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for your son Jesus and the wonderful gift you give to us through him and the gift he gave to us in eternal life. God, I pray that each one of us would give our lives to you, would give you our very best that we have, and love and serve you all of our days. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you're four or if you're in kindergarten. Morning, we sing a very beloved gospel song, The Old Rugged Cross. It is numbered 504 in your hymnal. Let us sing together all stanzas. 
and let us stand please to sing. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given so freely to us. Now let us return our gifts to you, and may they be used for the ongoing of thy kingdom. Amen.
Our scripture this morning comes to us from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Listen now for the word of God. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor with you, but you do not, always, do not always have me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Wasn't it a pity and a shame? 
Thank you, Beth, and thank you, uh, Brass Ensemble, for the great music today. We appreciate it. Life is filled with all kinds of twists and turns, but you probably know that already. I heard my father talk about a woman named Alma. All of my growing up days, he talked about her. Alma could outwork any man around, I remember him saying. And he would tell about hiring her to work on the farm. She could pick more cotton than any two men I know, I remember him saying. And she could haul hay with any man. She could handle those bells as good as anyone, he said. You see, I heard all about Alma's work, but I never met Alma. She no longer lived in our community. However, her name was implanted. It was truly implanted in my mind by my father's great appreciation for her hard work. Not only did my dad tell about how hard Alma worked, but he also told about what a hard life she had. It seems that life had not been very kind to her, but he never went into any details. Now, it is amazing, it is amazing how life has all those twists and turns, because years later, I was serving a church in a certain community, and one of the women in my church requested prayer for a lady her neighbor, who was dying with cancer. She was on the hospice program and, and her name was Alma. And for some reason, I just had a feeling. I just had a feeling. I, I couldn't wait to see if this was the real Alma that I'd heard so much about. I, I learned that this woman had no pastor and had no church to call her on, so I went to visit her. And to my utter surprise, it was the Alma. And in the next few months, Alma adopted me as her pastor. And even though she was too feeble to attend, she adopted my church as her church. And during that period of time, I learned that Alma was almost destitute. She lived alone in a very modest home. She had three children, each by a different father and she had never been married. And she was far, far from the strong woman that my father had talked about. Cancer had already begun to ravage her body. She was frail and emaciated, and I came to love her. I came to love her, and during that time, she came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then Alma died. And when I went to the funeral home that day, I was concerned about what kind of funeral she would have. She had no money, and I knew that, and, and I knew that it would be a sad uh, occasion indeed. No doubt she'd be buried as a pauper. I was sure at the expense of the county. And no one was there at the time but the, the funeral director, and he carried me into the parlor where the body was. And when I walked into the room, I couldn't believe my eyes. I simply couldn't believe my eyes. There stood a, a beautiful cherry wood casket. And the body inside didn't look at all like the woman that I had come to know. Her hair was dyed a dark black. And it was all frizzed up. Her makeup made her look many years younger and, and, and certainly defied the fact that, that cancer had truly ravaged her body. And, and the dress she wore, well, it was stunning. It was simply stunning. And I couldn't help but ask the funeral director a very nosy question. I asked, what happened? What happened? And he told me the story. Somewhere way back along the way, Alma had had obtained a small insurance policy. And after she had learned that, that she had terminal cancer, she went to the funeral home and, and, and they made a deal. They would bury her like she wanted to be buried and they would receive the insurance check. And therefore, Alma, the, the woman who had led a life as a hard working pauper, the woman who was used and abused 
by so many people in her life left this world in a very extravagant way, a very extravagant way. Now, some folks, I'm sure, looked into that casket and surely said, what a waste, what a waste. But was it? Was it? I want us to think about extravagance today. According to the dictionary, the word extravagance means exceeding the limits of reason or necessity. Exceeding the limits of reason or necessity. In fact, I want us to think about not only about extravagant, but I want us to think about extravagant love. Love that exceeds, exceeds the limits of reason. Love that exceeds the limits of necessity as well. To me, our scripture for today is so many things. It's puzzling. It's challenging. It's troublesome. It's a mystery. It's odd. It's uplifting. And so much more than that. And, and in their, their context, these verses are nested between two very important stories. The, the raising of Lazarus from the dead and Jesus' triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And, and the place where our scripture takes place is Bethany, a small village just over the Mount of Olives from Jerusalem. And it happened in the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They were having a meal, and, and Jesus was the guest of honor at that meal. And we don't know who all attended. We don't know who attended the meal, probably several, but other than Jesus, only Martha, Mary, Lazarus, and Judas are mentioned by name. Anyway, in the middle of that event, in the middle of our scriptures, Mary, one of the sisters of Lazarus, took a pound of perfume, a, a perfume called nard, or spikenard, a very expensive extraction from the roots and spike of a nard bush. The scripture doesn't go into big detail here. It, it just says that, that Mary used that expensive perfume and anointed the feet of Jesus and then wiped his feet with her own hair. And also there was that mention of Judas. The mention that Judas questioned what Mary did. He asked, why was it this perfume sold for its great value and, and the money given to the poor? Now I have to stop here and say, you know, that statement by Judas sounds real churchy, doesn't it? It, it sounds real churchy. Jesus, however, you'll recall, rebuked Judas. He said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she could use it at my burial. The poor you'll always have with you, but you won't have me all the time. That's how the story reads. But I wonder, what does the story really say? What does the story really say to us today? Well, let's look, and let's look at the people who were there for that meal. I think that we can learn from just the people who were there. Of course, Lazarus was there, and he shouldn't have been. Lazarus was there, the brother of, of Mary and, and Martha, and I, and I quote the scripture, was one of those at the table with him, was one of those at the table with him, and that's all it says. That's all it says about Lazarus. Lazarus had just been raised from the dead a few days before, and I'm sure that Lazarus at this point was just proud to be able to, as they say, sit up and take nourishment. He was proud to be able to just sit at the table and eat because just a few days the scripture says that he had been dead and even stinking. And now here he's sitting at the table with Jesus eating a meal. The fact is that, that Lazarus' resurrection was the beginning of Jesus' crucifixion. Lazarus' resurrection was the beginning of Jesus' crucifixion, and we don't need to gloss over that. We don't need to gloss over that at all, because after the raising of Lazarus from the dead, the Jews had a, had a meeting and, and basically said, Jesus is moving too fast, he's doing too much, it's better that he die than the whole Jewish nation be destroyed 
by the Roman government. So they began to plot to kill Jesus. And yet on this day, <clears throat> a few days later, Lazarus sat at the table with Jesus. How would you have felt had you been Lazarus? How would you have felt if you had been dead and even in the grave and then miraculously brought back to life? How would you have felt? Well, Lazarus that day just might have, have felt extravagant love. Love beyond reason, love beyond the limits because he was there and he wasn't supposed to be there. Martha was there. Martha was there too. She was a sister of Mary and Lazarus and she was there. And the scripture only says two words in regard to Martha. It says, Martha served. Martha served. That's it. That's all that it says. Why do you suppose Martha served at the table that day? Don't you suppose it, it could have been extravagant love as well? After all, Lazarus was her brother. And also John 5, 11 states that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when you know, when you know that someone loves you, isn't it a whole lot easier to love them in return? So I, I think Martha served out of great love for Jesus that day. It was her way of showing her world that she loved Jesus. Service can do that, you know. Service can. It, it can do that. It really can. And you don't even have to say a word while you're serving. Now, I want us to, to think for a moment about the quiet people in this particular church. The quiet people in this church who serve in a very extravagant way. I, I hesitate to call names. I really do. Because there are so many people that serve this church in a, in a quiet and a strong way. But Mrs. Jean McEwen is one. Miss Mack, as she is called by so many of us, she taught our youth Sunday school class for what? Nearly 40 years and prepared communion for our worship just as, for just as many years. And yet, quiet as a church mouse. Have you noticed that? Quiet as a church mouse and always smiling. Extravagant love. That's what it is. That's what it is. And, and, and yes, there are so many others. There are so many others. People who love the church, people who love their Lord, and, and they serve quietly and faithfully as their way of showing their great love for God and their great love for their church. Extravagant love. That's what it is. That's what it is. Serving and serving quietly. Doing what you feel deep in your heart that you need to be doing. That's one way that we can show our love for the church and our love for the Lord. Martha served. That's what the book says. That's what the Bible says. Martha served extravagant love. That's what that is. And Mary, of course, Mary was there. Mary was, was at the, the house in Bethany that day. She might as well been named the main character because she was the one who opened that, that container of expensive and fragrant perfume and anointed the feet of Jesus. And, and then she wiped Jesus' feet with her own hair. And the scripture says simply, the house was filled with the fragrance of perfume. Wow. What a, a beautiful picture that those words paint. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I, I find it interesting that, that Mary was, was only mentioned three times in the Bible. This particular Mary, three times in the Bible. And each time she is at the feet of Jesus. Luke 10, 38 tells us that, that she sat at the feet of Jesus to hear his words. And then John eleven thirty two 32 tells us that she knelt at Jesus' feet in sorrow over the death of her brother Lazarus. And now in these scriptures, she kneels at Jesus' feet and, and wipes his feet with her own hair. Sometimes where you are tells a story, my friends. 
Sometimes where you are tells the story of, of, of your great love, doesn't it? Now, it's, it's very tempting for me to go off on a tangent here and go into great detail about the expense of the perfume and, and the significance of the, the perfume to prepare a body for burial and, and reveal the fact that in that particular day, no decent woman would have dared to let her hair down in public because that was a sign of a harlot. But we're not going there today. It's much more important to, to come to understand that Mary did what she did because of her extravagant love for Jesus. Lazarus was her brother too. And, and somehow she had come to realize that, that this was a much larger story than even Jesus raising her brother Lazarus from the grave. And that is a big, big story in itself that she was thinking beyond her particular situation. Jesus had signed his death warrant with the raising of Lazarus and, and the Jewish leaders, of course, were all upset with that and, and Mary sensed that now Jesus was on the way to the cross and she was correct. She was correct. Extravagant love, that's what it is. That's what it is. Well, there was someone else at the table that day too and, and the gospel writer, you'll notice, didn't speak very well of him, didn't speak very highly of him at all, Judas. Judas was there. He was one of the 12 disciples. And, and when he saw what Mary had done, he, he asked, was it, why was it that expensive perfume sold for its great value and, and the money given to the poor? And Jesus said, Judas, leave her alone. Leave her alone. She, she bought the perfume for my burial. And, and you're always going to have the poor with you, but you're not going to have me with you forever. And somewhere along the way, it seems that Judas just never did. Judas just never got caught up in extravagant love. Nor service, nor adoration. No, it seems that Judas was, was more concerned with money and more concerned with power. Poor Judas. Poor Judas, so close to Jesus, so very close to Jesus, and yet so far away from what Jesus lived and what Jesus died for. So that day, those mentioned at the meal honoring Jesus were Lazarus and Martha, Mary and Judas, but there were more folks there too. Some we assume were there, but their names just weren't mentioned. And then there were, was us. There was us. Because the truth is, we were there too. You were there. I was there. Not, not only were we there in the very heart of Jesus Christ and what he was about and going to be about in the next few days, we were there because of each of us is, is a mixture of, of those four persons that were named here in our scripture. Sometimes, you know, we're like Lazarus. Sometimes we're like Lazarus, simply overwhelmed by, by the works that God has worked in our own personal lives. And we just kind of sit there in a daze wondering, what did I do to deserve this? Why did this happen to me? Why, I'm not even supposed to be here, but I am, I am. And sometimes we're like Martha, and we serve, and we serve well, and, and we do it because we love the church, and because we love our Lord, and because we are appreciative of, of all that God has done for us. So yes, sometimes we're like Martha, we, we serve, we serve. And, and sometimes we are like Mary, we really are, and we're determined to show our love and our appreciation for our Lord, no matter how much it costs us, no matter how much trouble we have to go through, and no matter what folks might say about what we're doing, because something deep within us tells us that, that we love Jesus and we should unashamedly show it to the world. Extravagant love, that's what that is. But sadly, let's face it, sometimes we're a lot like Judas. We don't smell the perfume. 
We just don't smell the perfume at all, even though it's all around us, even though it permeates everything about us, it, it permeates our clothes, our nostrils. We just don't smell the perfume. And we don't try to understand the significance of everything that happens. We don't try to understand the significance of the way God works in our lives. Instead, we count the cost. We count the cost. That's why we have to understand that, that Judas's statement was such a churchy statement. In fact, if, if that statement, if Judas's statement had been made in an administrative board meeting or maybe in a finance committee meeting, it, it could have been kosher. It could have been all right. In fact, I'm positive that, that I've heard statements like that in churches before. Haven't you? Why, that perfume could have been sold for a big, big price and the money given to the poor or the money given to the parking lot fund or, or the money given to help pay the preacher's salary or why do we send all those people off on those mission trips? We could have just sent the money over there and the money that it cost them to make that trip and, and it would have done a whole lot more good. Or why do we have so many Easter lilies in the church on Easter Sunday morning. We don't need all those. We don't need all of them. And, and the money saved could be used for some other project in the church. Or why do we keep on helping the same old people over and over? They're, they're never going to change. They, they won't work. They're hopeless. They're helpless. It's thinking like this that keeps us from smelling the perfume thinking like this that keeps us from smelling the perfume. People of God, not everything is figured in dollars and cents. Sometimes there, there should be and there is something that's deep within us that moves us to do something differently. Something that others might even challenge, something that others might even question, something that, that maybe doesn't make any sense at all from a financial point of view but something that makes good sense from a spiritual point of view. For sure, Mary taught us that extravagant love. Extravagant love, that's what it is. Extravagant love, something that is beyond our human reasoning. And may we never, ever forget this lesson here in our scriptures for today. Remember, the scripture says, that the house was filled with the smell of perfume. The house was filled with the smell of the perfume. Don't you think we need to smell the perfume? Don't you? Don't you think we need to smell the perfume? I challenge you to get your life in the situation so you will be able to smell the perfume that permeates you and this church and this community, your families all around, smell the perfume. Our hymn of invitation is 701, when we all get to heaven. And that's our goal. And my friends, let me assure you, when, when we reach that point that we can smell the perfume, then we'll all get to heaven. If we resist smelling the, the perfume, we may not all get to heaven. Would you not do as God leads you to do as we stand and sing this hymn this morning?
friends like Lazarus and so many more, we have experienced the extravagant love of Jesus our Lord. Now let us go forth, share that extravagant love to all people everywhere in the name of Christ. Thank you.